reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do His blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear, with His manna He my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see His way, rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Thank you. you. May be seated. Take your bulletins, if you would, please. If you've not received a bulletin, please raise your hand. Jimmy will make sure that you get one. We'll take your bulletins, if you would. We'll go through a few things. We appreciate everyone that came out and helped with the cleaning yesterday as we Got the church building nice and clean, so thank you for helping with that. We'll do it again next month, and uh, we look forward to also all that's coming up here in the next few months. We, we kind of right now at least have a little bit of a quiet uh, August and September, and uh, we'll be getting ready, however, for the holiday season, which will be on us before we now know it. Now, don't get me wrong, we'll be discipling throughout the week and Keep him busy with that. We'll be going on visitation. Keep him busy with that. I, I just mean there's no real uh, special events that we have planned at this time. Uh, we do have Lord's Supper coming up the end of September, which we look forward to. And uh, one thing we'd like to do just to kind of plant a bug in your ear is do a sort of a food drive uh, before Thanksgiving to uh, help someone out with any uh, food that's needed, some folks going through maybe a hard time or whatnot that comes across our way uh, this year. If we don't know of anyone, certainly there's other uh, like-minded churches in the area that know of someone, so want to be a blessing if at all possible. And then we, of course, in December have the Christmas banquet coming up, and so please uh, be praying about who God would have on your hearts to invite as we look forward to that time. We know the gospel will be preached and We'll have a blessed time there. This afternoon's uh, lunch, the fellowship is uh, breakfast for lunch, and so we hope you can stick around after the service as we'll be having our fellowship time, and then after that we'll have our Sunday afternoon service. Still breakfast right here? Okay, still breakfast. And we'll be looking this afternoon at Knowing God as we've been looking at for the past few weeks, and this time around, knowing God intimately or looking at our spiritual maturity. And so that's an exciting topic to look at as we gauge where we are spiritually. And then Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock, we'll be studying the Apostle Peter again as we look at Peter uh, backsliding. will be, I believe, if I remember correctly, in the passage where uh, Jesus is telling Peter that Satan desires to sift him as wheat. And so, hope you'll be in your place 7 o'clock as we have prayer meeting. We'll look forward to that time. At this time, we'll ask our ushers to come forward, get ready to take the offering up. Please do pray for Daniel as he's back in Savannah at his duty assignment uh, with the Army. So pray for him if you would. Uh, pray for Sarah, not my Sarah, but Sarah Liston as she's under the weather this morning, so pray for her, and as much as I know, Teresa, maybe too, anyone else I'm not aware of that's not feeling well, but we do praise the Lord for all the good things that happened this week. We got the HVAC system squared away, so no more uh, water leaking everywhere, and we got Johns and Romans ordered to restock what we have, so we praise the Lord for that, and visitation efforts yesterday. Just thank the Lord for that. and Just numerous blessings God's done for us this week. We praise him for that. Let's uh, pray over the offering then. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us and your help. We pray that you would bless the tithes and offerings as they're given, as it goes to your work for the furtherance of your gospel. We pray that we'd see many saved here through the efforts of this church family. We know that, Father, truly we are nothing it's you that works in us. It's you that works with us. 
We pray that we would understand this and simply trust you and be filled with your spirit and humble ourselves before you, each other, and fulfill your great commission as you'd have us uh, have us to. Father, we pray for these that are hurting today. We ask that you'd help Heather with her knee, that you give her grace. We pray you'd be with uh, Daniel as he's down at his uh, new assignment, Savannah, that you'd give him your grace, that he'd be able to find the the church down there that uh, you've led us to uh, find for him. We pray that it would be a blessing, those folks, uh, to him. We ask that you'd help uh, him in his work as he's uh, assigned to his unit and you know uh, your will for him there. Just pray that you'd help him. We ask that you'd be with Teresa. She's not feeling well with uh, Sarah as she's not also. That you'd help them to uh, get over the cold or the illness that they have. Father, thank you for being so good to us, for taking care of us. We pray that indeed you would fill us with your spirit, help us to receive the word as it's given, and that you would help us to seek for you to speak to our hearts today so we can apply your word. We could be made more like your son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you for all you do for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Phoebe. Let's turn to 176. Take your maroon hymnals. 176. The old account was settled. Maybe one you've not sung for a long time or at all. We'll work our way through it. We'll sing one, two, and four of 176. The old account was settled. There was a time on earth when in the book of heaven an old account was standing. For sins yet unforgiven, my name was at the top, and many things below. I went unto the keeper and settled long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago, and the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away. When the old account was settled long ago, the old account was large and growing every day, for I was always sinning and never tried to pay. But when I looked ahead and saw such pain and woe, I said that I would settle and so long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago, and the record's clear today, for you washed my sins away. When the old account was settled long ago, verse 4, O sinners, seek the Lord, repent of all your sin, for thus he hath commanded, if you could enter in. Then if you should live a hundred years below, and here you'll not regret it, you settled long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago, and the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away when the old account was settled long ago. That's a good old hymn, right? It's that one you've never sung before, ever. There's some there smiling, so I'm guessing that you've never sung it before ever, but that's okay. It's always good to learn new songs. Let's turn to John 3, if you would please, John chapter 3. As we finish up, Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus, John chapter 3. We're walking verse by verse through the book of John. We come to the end of this back and forth between the Lord Jesus and Nicodemus. It's a, a great, great uh, 
story that we can read, learn many things, certainly. John chapter 3, as we look in verse number 9, Nicodemus answers Jesus and said unto him, How can these things be? How can these things be? Talking about the things that Jesus just spoken to him about, being born again, born of water and of the Spirit, and the Spirit blowing where it listeth. And Jesus answered and said unto, unto him, Excuse me, art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Father, pray that you would speak to our hearts now, that you would take your word, and may it be plain to us. We thank you for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for our sins, that through him we can be saved. We thank you for salvation, being free for us, yet coming at a great cost for your son. We thank you for the change that comes upon our lives, upon salvation, that we can live increasingly sanctified life to be more like Jesus. Help us today. Help those of us that are saved to take heart, to be challenged, to be more like Christ. And Father, if there be anyone who does not know for sure heaven's their home. They don't know for sure they're born again, that their sins are forgiven. May it be clear for their need for salvation. Father, we pray that you will work as only your spirit can. We'll thank you for it. We yield ourselves to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we conclude with the subject, how can these things be? How can these things be? We've been walking through this passage here, looking at the mystery of the spiritual birth. How can someone be born again? How can someone be born of water and of the Spirit? We understand talking about being born physically, being born spiritually. How can the Spirit move upon someone? and birth someone into the family of God. As Jesus says, the wind bloweth where it listeth. Now here's the sound thereof, but canst thy tongue tell, excuse me, whence it cometh and whither it goeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit, understanding that the Spirit works how he works. God only pulls the curtain back so far for us to understand what works behind the scenes and how he works. Other things he says, just trust me. Just trust me. This is up for you to trust me for. The Spirit works how he works. We can't control how he works. We can't control his drawing. And yet he draws various individuals to be saved and praise him for that. We looked at the fact that the spiritual is lost upon the unsaved individual. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us it's the power of God. Why why 
the world says, would someone take their Sunday, take their Wednesday night, take their Saturday morning, take various times throughout the week and be disciple? Well, why would people do those things? Why would you take 10, 15, 30 minutes to an hour and read your Bibles every day? Why would you attend church? Why would you do that, the world says? They don't understand. We do it because God is and has done a work on our hearts and has shown us the truth of his son and his word. It's not that the preacher is going to give us spiritual demerits because we're not doing something for the Lord or that the denomination is going to do a certain thing or on and on it goes. That we could possibly lose our salvation, some say. No, it's because we love Christ that we do what we do. And if we're not doing what we do because we love Jesus, it is God's will that we get to that point as that is the only lasting lasting reason to live the Christian life is because the love of Christ constrains us. How can we not live for him for what he has done for us? But that is lost on the unsaved person. As Nicodemus says, how can these things be? And Jesus comes right back at him and says, art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? You're a Pharisee. You're a classically educated individual. You've gone to the equivalent or our equivalent of Bible college in his day. How can you not know this? Jesus says. And Jesus well knew the reason was Nicodemus was not a saved man at that point. He couldn't process it. How can these things be? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify we have seen. You receive not our witness. Speaking of Jesus' testimony, John the Baptist's testimony, the very prophet's testimony, and Jesus' very disciples' testimony. So we see in this whole conversation, Nicodemus asking questions and Nicodemus being challenged by the word of the Lord Jesus Christ to believe. We look, thirdly, that the spirit-filled Christian is to be the authority on the spiritual, as we just read. We do know, we have seen, and ye believe not. We can be authoritative. We need to be authoritative because we have the very word of God that is just that, the word of God. There is no other, the, this hymnal as wonderful as it may be, and this hymnal, as great as it may be, these are not the words of God unless it has the words of Scripture within it. The very Bible, the 66 books we have preserved for us, is the word of God that we can stand upon and say, thus saith the Lord. And this world needs that. There's people that go back and forth and say, well, I think so. I guess so. This is my opinion. This has been what I have contrived in my heart, no, the world needs, thus saith the Lord. This is what we say because God says so. God the creator, God our savior. So we considered the illustration of the spiritual birth and then lastly, the necessity of the spiritual birth. The illustration of the spiritual birth being put forth here in verse number 14 Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Remember Numbers 21, verse 5 through 9, we looked at last week, where the people sinned against God yet again. They complained against God and Moses. They said, you're not taking care of us. We're not getting the food that we want, even though we have the food that we need. God brings in the serpents to bite them and kill them, and they're dying, and they come to Moses and say, we've sinned. God go, or Moses turns to God and says, what do I do? God says, create a brazen serpent, put it on a pole, and whosoever shall look at that serpent shall live. And that's exactly what happened. We know that serpent is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ who became sin for us. God's wrath poured upon his own son, and that if we will look to Christ by faith, that we will receive eternal life, trusting in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So whosoever believeth in him should not perish, 
but have eternal life. The necessity of the spiritual birth. Verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We talked about the love of the Father in Sunday school, how there's not a parent alive that loves their children that wouldn't instantly, if a child says, I repent, bring me back, that would not say, welcome back. I love you. I've been waiting for you to come home. And God, our Heavenly Father, does just that. He waits for us. He seeks us. We don't seek Him. We have no capacity to seek Him. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 23, that we in no wise seek after Him. It's Him that seeks after us. It's Him that loves us. It's Him that reveals to us our sinfulness. Him that reveals to us our Savior, and Him that declares to us, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And so it is with John 3.16. He loved us, so He gave Jesus so that if we will believe on him, we'll not perish in our sins, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through the, excuse me, that the world through him might be saved. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's quite clear. Jesus is telling Nicodemus here, it's all about me. Anyone else, that would be an ego trip, wouldn't it? Anyone else, that would be prideful. But to Nicodemus here, it's a necessity if he's going to be saved. To come from the mouth of Christ, we know it's not ego and pride, it's truth. Jesus says to Nicodemus, it's all about believing on the Son. Why are we here today? To feel better about ourselves, to hear a self-help sort of a sermon, or to, to uh, talk about our problems and work through them as the world does. No, we're here because of the Son. We're here because of Jesus. We're here to glorify Him. We're here because of what He's done for us and for God to speak to us so that we can be more like him. That is why we have church. That is why we do what we do. To please, not the world, and to appeal to the world, but to please Christ. The Bible says that the world didn't need Christ to condemn them. They already had their own condemnation, and that condemnation is called the law. We looked at uh, three things, actually, the spirit, the conscience, and the very law that's given. Even if folks don't have the Word of God and they don't have the Ten Commandments, if we went out and broke those commandments, we went out and killed somebody or told a lie or stole something, we would still feel conviction because of our conscience. We would still know that that is wrong. We don't need Jesus to come to earth to condemn us, and that's not why he came. We're already condemned. We already know we're sinners. We already have the written law that tells us we're sinners, that says if you follow all several hundred laws that you can be saved, and we know we've already broken them, and thus we can never be saved, and we have our conscience within us that tells us that we're sinners. So we need no one to tell us that we're sinners, which is what the passage is stating. We know ourselves. We need someone to tell us how to be saved. We need someone to help us. And thus we give the gospel in such a way where we show that we are sinners, and then we reveal Christ as the Savior. For the person that is in a burning building, unless they know the burning building is burning, they won't want to be saved. Unless the person on the sinking ship knows the ship is sinking, they won't want to be saved. 
They won't desire, just like that young man in the parable of the lost son. He's out there spending his wealth, living a life of pleasure. It wasn't until he fell into sin so far they ended up wasting his living in the very mud pit of the pigs. That was when he came to himself, wasn't it? When he realized he was in trouble. So we see the necessity of the spiritual birth. Verse 19 says, this is the condemnation. That light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Did Jesus come into the world to condemn us? No, but by his very presence and by his very message, it condemned us anyway. Because we know we're sinners. By Jesus' very presence on this world, he shone light as he says he is the light of the world. He couldn't help it. One man that never sinned, that only ever lived a righteous life, stands out as a beacon amongst a world of darkness. And that's what he came to. Man that never said a wrong thing, that never did a wrong thing, that never saw a wrong thing or heard a wrong thing. That was our Christ, the sinless one. Tempted in all points, like as we are yet without sin. The Pharisees hated him because he only ever spoke truth. He didn't try to conform to the Roman way or to the Jewish way. He stood for God's way, right? And thus they hated him. The people that hated him because he just shone light and many of them rejected light. But there were those that accepted too, weren't there? Look at Romans chapter 7, verse number 7. We'll reiterate just a few things that we mentioned. It's not the darkness that condemns us, it's the light. Without Jesus, without the law, without our conscience, we're just happy to romp around in sin, aren't we? It's when the light starts to shine that we start to see who we really are. And imagine if you were in a room, a very dark room, you step into that room and unbeknownst to you, that room's filled with the worst thing you can imagine, spiders or snakes or what have you. Well, as long as that room is dark and quiet, you don't know the danger. But when you turn the light on, then you see the danger. That's what we're talking about here. Romans chapter 7, verse 7, the Apostle Paul is speaking. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. How do we know what's right and wrong? The law tells us. But sin, it says, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Because the law says you follow me and you can go to heaven, basically. You follow me and God's okay with you. When we find out we're sinners, when the light shines on us, it condemns us. Death rises. And that's all the law brings. It was our schoolmaster, Galatians says, bringing us simply to death. But we need the light to see that sin. And we need the light to see the Savior. We see that men are condemned by the presence of light. And then secondly, they often reject light because they love sin. You know, our hearts are not good. We like to say that about one another. But the truth of the matter is, we ought to be like the Apostle Paul who says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Go around and saying with the Apostle Paul that we're just the chiefest of sinners, right? We're born into sin. Our hearts are desperately wicked. And so we grow to love sin. 
We even become desensitized to sin. Romans chapter 1 talks about the heart that some human beings on earth have been given. Again, you wonder, why is the world the way it is? It's because, by and large, people have been desensitized to sin. The devil's very good at that. It takes a lot of work to live a life that pleases the Lord because of the way of the world. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verse 28, it talks about the conscience and creation being given in previous verses. And he says in verse number 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. They've seared their conscience so much that sin no longer bothers them. A reprobate mind, a mind that is not normal, a mind that is not pleasing to God, a mind that the conscience can no longer convict. That's a sad state to get in, isn't it? A reprobate mind. Now look at what it says. To do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, everything that's against the scriptures, fornication, and wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy and murder and debate, and deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only to do this, excuse me, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. As believers, we need to guard our lives against such things. Because we can sear our conscience too, over and over and over again. I mean, look at the things that's listed here. There's the things that we say, oh, well, I would never do that. And how can other people do these things? It's because they de have desensitized themselves to these things. I mean, look down, um, talking about uh, murders. How, how can someone become a serial killer and, and someone go and just kill someone over and over and over and over again? Because maybe they've killed someone the first time or maybe even, and this does happen. I'm not saying that all of these video games are wrong, but when you get on a video game and you kill someone virtually over and over and over and over again and you have the gore and all the various things, just these nasty things, your conscience inevitably gets desensitized to that. Or you watch it on TV or in movies over and over and over and over and over again. That's why as parents or adults, we have to watch ourselves and we have to watch it for our children as to what, if any, degree they're going to be exposed to that. They're going to be exposed to it in the world eventually anyway, but that's not an excuse to expose them to the very just most reprobate uh, violence that's out there. People say, how can people do this? By in part, that's one way. You have um, whispers and backbiters, people that go around talking about other people. Well, that didn't just start. Some people, that becomes their life because they've seared their conscience so much that they have no problem stabbing people in the back over and over and over and over again. I'm not talking about physically, but talking about people, hurting them, right? Disobedient to parents. They're, they're, that's why children need corrected because it's in our hearts to be disobedient. And a child that's disobedient and left to disobedience, their conscience is not going to be convicting them about it. They have no problem disobeying over and over and over and over and over again, which is why we see what we have in the world. Covenant breakers, those that will shake your hand and give you their word, and then just like that, turn and break their word. Why is the world filled with liars? 
because someone was allowed to lie once and over and over and over and over, it became their habit to lie. And some people don't even know that they're lying. Their conscience is seared without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. You say, how can people be like this? Because it started and it continued and now their conscience no longer convicts them. By the way, again, we have to guard ourselves against such things. Lest we get to one or multiple of these. It's the Bible that tells us where we're right, where we're wrong, how to get it right, right? That's what 2 Timothy tells us. Where we're right, where we're wrong, how to get it right, how to stay right, and live a righteous life for God. But people don't like that. That's why it's more difficult for adults to be saved than for children because children don't have the baggage that many adults have, whether of righteousness or unrighteousness. Children often don't have the things to overcome that many adults have. People have all manner of things that happen to them over the course of their lives. We could all tell each other stories, couldn't we? By the grace of God, if you're here today, you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior. By the grace of God, He has saved us. He showed us that we're sinners. We, by His grace, have accepted that we're sinners. And by the way, we have to understand that we'll be fighting against that sin nature till we get to heaven. We have to come to hate the sin nature. Come to hate that old man. That pride that says that we know better than God. Because there's times that we hate the light too, isn't it? There's times that people try to help us and reprove us and say, I'm concerned about you. I love you. This is what the Bible says and this is what I see. We like to say, well, who are you to tell me anything? That's why it must be the word. We have to be humble. We have that old flesh. Men are condemned by the presence of light. They often reject it because of love of sin, but some embrace it. Verse 20 says, For everyone that doeth evil, everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest or revealed that they are wrought in God. The light adds two things to our lives, actually three, that we see here. It adds authority to our lives. Authority. We live in a country, we live in a society. Just go on social media, watch the news, our society hates authority hates authority oh we we put on a good show and we say well we we support the police and we support the military and whatnot I'm talking about those walking in their flesh in the world now as believers we're supposed to love authority because it gives structure to our lives and it gives us accountability we're supposed to love the authority of the word of God we're supposed to love the authority of our savior we're supposed to love and submit ourselves to the God-given authorities to our lives. Our flesh still hates it, doesn't it? I was a teenager too once, and I hated obeying my parents. Our flesh still hates it. We don't want to submit to the supervisors at work, do we? Our flesh still hates it. We don't like it when the president or when Congress or the Senate or the mayor or, or whoever that's over us as far as governmental things. We don't always like what they do or what they say, but they're still the authority that God has given, right? We don't always like it. That's when we have a choice to submit to it or to rebel against it. We live in a society that encourages rebellion. It gives people the day off so they can go out and protest various things. 
That's our society. We even have churches that say, well, if they start to infringe on your rights, you don't submit, you rebel, 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 rebel. That's just the flesh. Our flesh says, I want one person in authority over me, and that's me, doesn't it? That's our flesh. But as believers, we've accepted, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The minute that we believe what this says, really about anything, but especially about salvation, that we are not good enough to go to heaven, that there's no religion that can take us to heaven, have our sins wiped away, that there's no religious rite that we can perform to wash our sins away, that it's all Jesus. The moment that we accept what this book says, we have submitted ourselves to the authority of Christ, and it's not meant to stop there for the Christian walk. It's meant to continue increasingly, as Romans 12 says, to surrender, to submit, to not be conformed to this world but to be transformed, the renewing of our minds, right? As Romans chapter 8 says that it's God's will, he's working all things together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call of the coin to his purpose. But verse 29 says that it is his will, that it is our destiny to be conformed to the image of Christ. That means he's our authority. He's the one we surrender to. I mean, you look at Peter, you, you, you may say, well, I can't, I can't follow Jesus like I should. None of us can. I can't surrender him to him like I ought to. None of us can. Not in our flesh. We need God's help for that. Look at Peter. Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He got saved. He professed Christ. And then not a year or two later, he denies the very Christ he professed. He gets full of himself. He leaves the ministry. He made mistakes just like we will and we do. But Christ reached out to him and said, Peter, lovest thou me? Lovest thou me? Do you love me, Peter? And Peter, for the first two times, says, I can't love you like you want me to love you. Here's how I can love you. And Jesus Jesus said, Peter, do you love me like a brother? And Peter says, that's how I can love you, like a brother. In John 21, God knows where we are. He knows where we are spiritually. He knows where we are as far as our, our uh, imma uh, immaturity and maturity. He knows how far we have to grow. He knows the baggage that we bring with us into salvation. He knows it all. And yet he still loves us, wants to use us. The key to the Christian walk is simply walking day by day and growing day by day, letting Jesus be the authority day by day. And when, when we don't let him be the authority, say, I'm sorry, I overstepped my bounds. Help me to do better, as 1 John 1, 9 says. It requires us to be humble before the Lord. The light adds authority. It also adds accountability. Again, our society doesn't like that, does it? Accountability. Just look at history of our country. It's rejected accountability and Accountability is an obligation or willingness to accept responsibility or account for one's actions. We don't like that, not in our flesh. We like being accountable to us, not accountable for anything. That's not natural. That's not how we were designed. We're the creation accountable naturally to the creator. Look in Isaiah 30 in verse number 9 through 11. Isaiah 30, verse number 9 through 11. Scripture says here, Isaiah 30 and verse number 9, 
go up to verse number eight, the beginning of the, the paragraph. Now go, God says, write it before them in a table, note it in a book that may be for the time to come forever and ever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, talking about the nation of Israel, their coming exile, they're a rebellious people. They won't hear the law of the Lord. Which say to the seers, see not, to the prophets prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. That's the world today, isn't it? No accountability. You know, 2 Timothy 4, Paul charges Timothy to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, because the day will come where people will have itching ears, right? It's the same thing that's here. The people would literally look at the prophets. The kings would look at the prophets. You have records of it in the prophets themselves. And they would say, give me a good message today. Give me something I want to hear, Jeremiah, Isaiah. Don't give me what God has. Give me what I want to hear. And so is society today. Make me feel good. God's not about making us feel good. He's about making us more like Jesus. And sometimes we need to feel bad so that we can get right and be more like Jesus and be stronger in the faith. Rebellious people, lying children. People that say, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits, get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. We don't care about God, get rid of God. We don't want God in our country, in our communities. That's what we have today. That's what we want in our flesh. I don't want to be accountable to anyone. I don't want to report to anyone when all is said and done. I, I don't want the home structure that God puts forth. I don't want the work structure God puts forth. I don't want the church structure God puts forth. I don't want the governmental structure that God puts forth. I can't trust God to be in control of anything. I can't trust that God will make it all right in the end. I have to do something now is what the world says. That's not faith or anything close to faith. It's flesh. The light adds that accountability. And does not change the fact that we'll all give an account to God one day. Romans chapter 14, verse 10 through 12 says so. We're all going to bow the knee to Christ. Saved, unsaved, child of God, child of the devil, atheist, believer in God, everyone's going to bow the knee and profess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is written in stone. It will happen and we will be there. The Bible says, Romans 14, verse 10, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. As it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. There is coming a day of account, and we will give it. For the saved, the Bible says that it will be given an account, basically to sum it up, of what we did with our salvation. Did we grow in Christ? Did we seek to complete or work the great commission that he's given us. I saw a good quote on, on social media this morning. One, one preacher said to pastors, he said, Pastor, are you in it for the power? Are you in it for the, for the fame? Are you in it for the money? He said, are you in it to give the gospel? Hopefully win the loss to Christ and 
help the saved to grow in Christ. So if you're in it for the money, the power, the fame, get out of the ministry now. And he's right, because that's not what it's about. It's about the Great Commission. It's about doing the work God's given us to do, helping the unsaved to hear the gospel, and by God's grace, they'll be saved, because we can't save anyone, and the saved to grow in Christ through discipleship and the preaching of God's word and application of such things to our lives. That's, that's what it's all about. Our flesh doesn't like it, but we will answer for it one day. And saying such things would come to the last. The light adds accountability, adds authority, but also brings us to a choice. And here at the very end of this conversation, you have a choice given to Nicodemus. Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. Jesus says to Nicodemus, which one are you? He says, are you one that hates the light? He says, I've given you the truth. Some of it you've understood and some of it you haven't. But I've given you the truth. I've given you light. Do you hate the light like your fellow Pharisees? Do you hate the light like, like the Sadducees and the Herodians? Do you hate the light? Are you going to come to the light? Because you seek to do truth. Interesting phrase, doeth truth just means to do good out of an honest heart. Bear good fruit. As we've said, everyone that seeks light, everyone that seeks truth, that God's drawing them and they respond to it and they say, yes, Lord, give me more truth. Yes, Lord, give me more truth. Yes, Lord. They'll keep receiving truth and more light unto salvation unto spiritual maturity. We have that choice. We can live in darkness, love the darkness, do evil and hate light, reject Christ. Or we can seek truth, love truth. Yes, the light may hurt and convict us and show us who we really are but also shows Jesus for who he really is. And when we see him, will we accept him? All of us have to make such a decision for salvation, for spiritual growth. We can't think that we can be saved without Christ. We can only be saved through him. And that's the invitation we see here. Nicodemus, are you going to love the darkness like everyone else? Or are you going to come to the light? Believe in the light. And prove what God's doing in your heart. Father, I pray that you would help us this morning. I pray you would show us ourselves. We know that we're sinners. Father, all of us need the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for saving us from our sin and we pray you'd help us to walk with him, to grow, to not go back to the darkness, increasing that darkness, but to walk ever closer to the light. As we know, John says he is in the light. Help us to stay close to our shepherd. Father, we pray that if there be anyone here today that does not know Christ as their Savior, that they would come to the light, believing in Christ alone, rejecting our pride and our works of righteousness, which are as filthy rags, and all that we have, but coming to Christ. 
We pray you work in this invitation time that you would bless whatever you're speaking to our hearts about, that we would do business with you. Not fearing how or what may come, but trusting that your word is good, your promises are true, and that you help every child that walks with you by faith. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, my wife's going to play invitation. Let's stand together, heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. If you need to do business with God, pray in your pew, that's fine, or come forward and pray, that's fine too. Whatever God's speaking to you about, speak to him, say yes to him.